This video is brought to you by LegalEaglesCopyrightCourse.com, giving all creators the tools they need to fight bogus copyright claims. COP is here and it's going to change YouTube forever. Is your channel going to be affected or is it going to affect a channel that you love? And if it is, what can be done about it? This is a complicated area of the law and some of the bad news is true, but I also haven't seen any one commentator get things 100% right. And in some respects, we don't have some of the answers that we need uh, for creators or viewers of YouTube. But the bottom line is that YouTube is going to change forever. <laughs> Hey Legal Eagles, it's time to think like a lawyer because COPPA is complicated. And this particular situation with the intersection of COPPA and YouTube deals with federal law, regulatory rulemaking, federal lawsuits, settlements between YouTube and the FTC and YouTube's internal policies. And creators are right in the middle of everything. But today we're going to discuss everything that you need to know about COPPA and how we found ourselves in this situation. This will probably be a longer video because we're gonna look at the actual language of the law. I haven't seen really anyone take a deep dive into the relevant language that's at issue because it's really, really complicated and it's really important. And some of these things you can't dumb down because the effects are so dire. We're going to talk about if COPPA applies to your channel or if it applies to channels that you love to watch. And if COPPA does apply, we're gonna talk about what creators can and should do as a result. We're gonna talk about why you should care whether you have a YouTube channel or not. And we're gonna talk about what everyone can do, whether you are a channel operator or just a viewer of YouTube, to deal with some of the more onerous regulations of COPPA and what we can do to make sure that it is more narrowly tailored to the needs of channel creators and the audience on YouTube. So first, what is COPPA? COPPA is the Children's Online Privacy Protection Act. It was passed in 1998 under the Clinton administration and became effective in April of 2000. The Federal Trade Commission is the regulatory body that is in charge of actually enforcing COPPA. Now, the purpose of COPPA was and is to protect children from strangers and being unfairly targeted by advertisers. It's to prevent kids from posting their information, like their address, phone number, and social security online without parental consent. So why does COPPA exist? COPPA was created to put parents back in control of kids providing information online. It was enacted into law after the FTC issued a report called the Kidscom Letter where the FTC had investigated a now defunct website called Kidscom from the late 90s aimed at children which required users to provide a litany of personal information including name, date of birth, location, email address, home address, and product and activity preferences. Many parents complained about this kind of children's privacy violation and the FTC at the time didn't feel like it had the uh, tools necessary to prevent this kind of predatory practice against children. When Congress was considering COPPA, the FTC commissioner at the time Robert Potofsky testified to the, quote, particular vulnerability of children and the immediacy and ease with which information can be collected from them. COPPA passed the House 333 to 95, and it passed the Senate 65 to 29 and was signed into law by President Clinton in 1998. The FTC has enforced penalties from violations of COPPA at least 30 times, uh, ranging from companies like GeoCities, Lisa Frank, Sony Yelp, and many others. But let's first start with the actual language of COPPA. You can find the statute at 15 U.S.C. section 6502. Uh, that's the section titled Regulation of Unfair and Deceptive Acts and Practices in Connection with Collection and Use of Personal Information from and About Children on the Internet. Specifically looking at subsection A2, Acts Prohibited. In general, it is unlawful for an operator of a website or online service directed to children or any operator that has actual knowledge that it is collecting personal information from a child to collect personal information from a child in a manner that violates the regulations prescribed under subsection B. So in general, what this statute is saying is that any operator of an online website or service that is targeted to children cannot collect personal information from a child without parental consent. And it's also important to note that a child is defined by the statute as someone who is under the age of 13, so 12 years old and younger. Now in section 6501, COPPA defines the term personal information and uh, defines it to mean individually identifiable information about an individual collected online, including the first and last name, a home or other physical address, including street name, name of a city or town, an email address, a telephone number, a social security number, and importantly, any other identifier that the commission determines permits the physical or online contacting of a specific individual. Now you've probably listened 
listened to that statutory definition and thought, okay, this all seems fine. Parents don't want their children to be contacted by people online, uh, strangers or advertisers, and they certainly don't want their children's social security numbers publicized online. But how does this relate to YouTube? It's not like YouTube or creators are out there asking for anyone's social security number or their addresses, let alone the addresses and social security numbers of children. Well, the thing that you need to understand about American administrative agencies, including the FTC in this particular case, is that they have what's called rulemaking authority under the Administrative Procedures Act. When Congress passes a law, they have neither the time nor the inclination to cover absolutely every eventuality that could possibly happen. So they empower federal agencies to create rules that are under the auspices of the general law that has been passed and doesn't obviously contradict that law, but is sort of a minor expansion of that law to cover things that Congress might not have been able to contemplate at the time that the statute was passed. And here, the statute specifically endows the FTC with the authority to expand the definition of personal information to include other things that the FTC believes that allows a child to be contacted either physically or online. And there are several terms that I mentioned just now in those definitions that have big implications based on the definition that the FTC has adopted. Now, what I read to you previously, that is the actual COPPA statute as passed by Congress. But the rules that the FTC has promulgated over time are found in what's called the Code of Federal Regulations, the CFR for short. And the FTC promulgated new rules about COPPA in 2013 in ways that had a drastic effect on how COPPA interacts with YouTube. 2013 is when everything changed. So let's look at the rules that the FTC promulgated, specifically at 16 CFR 312.2. We find the definition of the term operator. Operator means any person who operates a website located on the internet or an online service and who collects or maintains personal information from or about the users of or visitors to such websites website or online service, or on whose behalf such information is collected or maintained. Now that's important. The FTC in 2013 expanded the definition of operator to include those uh, on whose behalf such personal information of children was collected. And that's why COPPA now applies to YouTube creators and YouTube channels, because it's on their behalf that YouTube collects that personal information. Now, in the same section, we find a definition of personal information. Now, this definition largely tracks the definition that's found in the statutory language of COPPA, including the address, telephone number, and social security number of children. But what was new in 2013 was this new definition of a persistent identifier. That did not exist prior to 2013, and that is one of the most important rules that the FTC promulgated in 2013. A persistent identifier is something that allows a website or service to track individual users over time. Generally, this is found in the form of a cookie. It's a file that is placed on your computer and watches your activity over time. It's the way that a website is able to deliver personalized content to individual users, whether that's in the form of a video that you want to see based on your prior history of videos or a specific ad based on products and services that you were looking at earlier before. And in the context of YouTube, both of those things are true. It's the way that YouTube tracks your viewing habits in order to give you a video that you want to see based on your prior viewing history. And it's the way that YouTube is able to get creators paid because they're delivering targeted ads to that particular audience. And as a result, the ad rates that creators receive is significantly higher than if the ads were contextualized. A contextualized ad is sort of the opposite of that. It's based on on the substance of the video as opposed to the prior behavior of the audience. So uh, when kids are watching Saturday morning cartoons and you see a cartoon for G.I. Joe placed in the middle of a G.I. Joe television show, well, that's a contextualized ad. Some people hate targeted ads and being tracked online using cookies. They see it as a violation of their right to privacy. And other people really enjoy them because they see content in the form of advertisements that apply specifically to them. And thus it's a win-win for both the advertiser and the viewer. But the bottom line is that YouTube can't really function without persistent identifiers. The algorithm, the YouTube algorithm itself would not exist if not for the invention of persistent identifiers. It allows YouTube to show content to people that they want to see 
because of an algorithm that is based on their prior behavior. Without persistent identifiers, the YouTube algorithm doesn't work and YouTube as a platform probably doesn't exist. And in 2013, the FTC changed the rule so that YouTube could no longer use persistent identifiers with respect to children. Remember, anyone under the age of 13, persistent identifiers are totally off the table. And in theory, that shouldn't affect the user experience of adults, but we'll talk about in a few minutes how that theory doesn't really meet practice, unfortunately, and it does affect adults. Now, before we leave section 312.2, let's talk about how COPPA is triggered. There are two ways to trigger COPPA. One is that you create content that is child-directed, or two, you have actual knowledge that children are using your online service or website. So let's talk about the first requirement that something is child-directed. This section states that a website or online service directed to children means a commercial website or online service or portion thereof that is targeted to children. In determining whether a website or online service or a portion thereof is directed to children, the commission will consider its subject matter, visual content, use of animated characters or child-oriented activities and incentives, music or other audio content, age of models, presence of child celebrities or celebrities who appeal to children, language or other characteristics of the website or online service, as well as whether advertising, promoting, or appearing on the website or online service is directed to children. The commission will also consider competent and reliable empirical evidence regarding audience composition and evidence regarding the intended audience. The 10-factor analysis is purposefully written vaguely. That vagueness provides flexibility. Unfortunately, it also provides uncertainty. But the important thing to remember is that it's not a checklist. You can't simply say that, okay, you have checked off factors one through four, but not factors five through 10. And as a result, it's not child directed. Uh, you have to weigh them. So the good news is that, say for example, if you have an animation channel, just because it mentions animated characters, that doesn't mean you are per se a child directed channel. And it's also conceivable that uh, you might meet all of the factors uh, in this test, except for let's say the first factor talking about the subject matter of the particular video. And it's possible that the subject matter is so adult that it counteracts meeting all of the other factors or having an example of some of those factors. So conceivably, there could be a video out there that is adult themed, but happens to check all of the other boxes, like there is a child celebrity there, or there is childish music and there's animated characters. But the fact that it is so adult oriented counteracts all of the other factors. So that's the point of having the flexibility of this 10 factor test is that you have to weigh each one with uh, the other factors. And just because you meet some of the factors, it doesn't mean that you are automatically shunted into the child directed category. You have to holistically weigh all of them against each other. So in terms of child directed, it's an intended to be a proxy for the intent of the author. Does the author intend this material, this online service or videos, uh, for children, people under the age of 13? Of course, the FTC would have a really hard time trying to figure out the intent of the author, so they created these 10 or so factors that are objective in nature. You can look to the website or the video itself, and you can run through these factors and actually get an idea for whether these factors are present or they're missing. So these 10 factors are what would allow the FTC to make a judgment call as to whether a particular YouTube channel is in fact child-directed or not. Now, the other way for COPPA to be triggered if you are a content creator is if you have actual knowledge that children are using your website or watching your videos. This section states that a website or online service shall be deemed directed to children when it has actual knowledge that it is collecting personal information directly from users of another website or online service directed to children. So for example, if someone left a comment on your video that says, I am a 10 year old child, and you read that comment, you might have actual knowledge that children are watching your content. Of course, YouTube would probably ban that person immediately because they then have also actual knowledge that a child is using their website and YouTube is directed for only people above the age of 13. Uh, but still, that is one way to get actual knowledge that children are using your site or watching your videos. And importantly, handing off your iPad from an adult to a child does not qualify as verified consent. Now that brings us to the so-called mixed audience exception. What if you are Major League Baseball and you know that adults 
watch your videos, but they also know that children watch those videos too. The fact that one child might be watching a video, does that mean that suddenly your video is child directed? Well, maybe, maybe not. Under this section, a website or online service that is directed to children under the criteria set forth in paragraph one, which we already talked about, uh, but that does not target children as its primary audience shall not be deemed to be directed to children if one, it does not collect personal information from any visitor prior to collecting age information, and two, prevents the collection, use, or disclosure of personal information from visitors who identify themselves as under age 13 without first complying with the notice and parental consent provisions of this part. So the mixed audience exception is not as simple as saying that the intended audience of this video is not primarily children. It's that, but you also have to prove that you are no longer using persistent identifiers of children and that you are getting age information before allowing people to view that content. And because of the way that YouTube is set up, it is not clear that any particular YouTuber can avail themselves of this exception. On the other hand, the argument can be made that because individual creators are not using persistent identifiers and they rely on the general YouTube platform, which is itself uh, age gated in that you can't create a YouTube account without uh, verifying that you are over the age of 12, uh, that uh, perhaps individual creators can avail themselves of the mixed audience exception, that uh, they know whether their intended audience is primarily children or not, which uh, meets the first level uh, criteria of the mixed audience exception. And uh, given the way that the YouTube system is set up that is now explicitly segregating between child audiences and non-child audiences, that uh, maybe the mixed audience exception does apply. And if that is the case, it does make sense that there isn't sort of a third option when you're uploading a video because uh, instead of having three options between child-directed, not child-directed, and mixed, uh, remember the mixed audience exception is an exception to child-directed. So if the mixed audience exception applies, uh, you would simply check the box when you're uploading a video that says not child-directed because mixed audience is an exception to the child-directed standard. But that's something that requires clarification from the FTC and YouTube. Now we'll talk about the mixed audience exception at length in just a moment, but suffice to say, it's not the savior that some people think it is. So given that, in a second, I'm gonna talk about whether your particular channel or your particular video qualifies as directed to children or whether the mixed audience exception may apply in your particular case. But before we get there, while we're still talking about the more technical aspects of it, I wanna talk about the repercussions of what happens if your content is considered uh, directed at children. Well, we've already talked about how YouTube cannot use persistent identifiers, cookies or IP addresses uh, to track children. So when a video is considered directed at children, YouTube has to effectively shut off the algorithm. It can't recommend that video, and it also can't use targeted ads for that particular video because that would be targeting the user. It's not clear exactly how less profitable contextualized ads compared to targeted ads are, but by all accounts, uh, contextualized ads probably bring one-tenth of the ad revenue of a targeted ad. So that means that people who create uh, kids' content might see their AdSense fall to one-tenth of the current levels. But it also means that YouTube has to effectively shut off any conduit for uh, personalized information from being uh, created on the video. That means that uh, YouTube has to shut off all of the comments on the video. Uh, that video can have no info cards or end screens, no recommendations, no notifications, no use of the community tab, and no stories. Uh, on YouTube for that particular channel if the whole channel is considered a kids directed channel. Remember, so much of what makes YouTube work is the persistent identifiers in conjunction with the YouTube algorithm. And that's simply off limits for both children as an audience and content that is considered directed at children. Now, YouTube has taken the position that when a piece of content is labeled as child-directed, YouTube will assume that the entire audience is children, regardless of whether they have verified that one of those people could be an adult. They will turn off all of the comments, they'll turn off notifications, and you can't use persistent identifiers or uh, benefit from the YouTube algorithm. Now, theoretically, you can use all of this information, you just need to have parental consent. Unfortunately, the parental consent provisions in COPPA are incredibly onerous, and are very unlikely to actually be used in real life. 
So let's talk about the big question. How do you know if your particular video or channel is considered directed at children? Well, we've already talked about the 10 factors that the FTC considers, the consent order that YouTube had to sign uh, as a settlement of the FTC complaint against it, uh, has a modified version of the 10 factors that you find in the CFR, specifically subject matter, visual content, use of animated characters, music, age of models, presence of child celebrities, celebrities who appeal to children, language and other characteristics, uh, advertising, promoting uh, the website, and uh, competent and reliable empirical evidence regarding. So those are the 10 factors that creators are going to have to use to analyze their particular content to determine if their content is considered child-directed or not. Remember, those factors are supposed to be a proxy for the intent of the creator. But because the factors are relatively objective, effectively the FTC could disagree. Even if you had a bona fide true belief that your content was not directed at children, the FTC could use those 10 factors to disagree with your own intent and to find that your content is in fact child directed. But because these are 10 factors, that means that there is going to have to be some kind of balancing. When there is a factor-based test, you know that all of these different elements are going to come into consideration. Odds are they're not gonna go after some creator with a small number of subscribers and something that's a close call, but still, theoretically, the FTC could do that. Now, sometimes factors are more important than others, and we have no guidance from the FTC as to which particular factors they may weigh heavier than other ones. But we can be sure that probably none of these factors acts as a per se indication that any content is directed at children. For example, I've been hearing a lot of creators who have uh, animated channels being worried that because their channel is animated that they are necessarily going to be considered child directed. And I, I don't think that's accurate. Even though animation is a factor in these 10 factors, you would have to weigh the fact that a channel is animated with the fact that they're dealing with adult subject matter. And you'd have to weigh that against all of the other 10 different factors. Uh, so for example, uh, Odd Ones Out uh, often does uh, very adult themes on their channel, despite being considered animated. I I probably would not consider that channel to be uh, child directed. That's just my own opinion. Uh, reasonable minds may differ. But the bottom line is that these are factors and they have to be weighed. It's likely that none of these are going to be dispositive. So I wouldn't necessarily worry that if your channel uses music, for example, or your channel happens to have some animation in it, that uh, per se you have a child directed video. But it's problematic because we have no guidance from the FTC as to how we are supposed to weigh these different factors and if something is more important than the others. It's also problematic because often creators don't know the audience that they have. YouTube often doesn't provide some of these statistics, including, for example, people who are under 13 years of age. And even if you did know the makeup of your audience, right down to exactly how many children versus 18 versus 30 year olds were watching your content, the FTC also has purposefully never created a bright line rule with respect to how many children tips the balance into making your channel child directed. The 10th factor appears to, uh, to look at the empirical evidence of who's watching your channel, but let's say your channel has one child, does that tip the balance? Does that make your video child directed? If you had 25% of your audience, is that child directed? 50%, 75%? In some ways, it's good that we don't have this bright line rule because it allows for flexibility, but at the same time, that flexibility also creates uncertainty as well. So in a second, I'm going to talk about the mixed audience exception in great detail, and I'm gonna talk about what creators might do if they make child-directed content, or they have a channel that is followed both by adults and children at the same time. The FTC says that individual YouTube creators are responsible for knowing whether their content is child-directed or not, and it is the responsibility of individual creators to make that designation on their videos and on their channel at large. And theoretically, if a creator gets that wrong, and they label something that is child-directed as not child-directed, then they could be fined by the FTC. Now, practically speaking, the FTC doesn't have all that many funds. Uh, they have only enforced COPPA a handful of times over the years. But still, the fact remains that they can go out and sue individual creators, and they have said as much that they intend to do so. The FTC loves to talk about clear-cut examples when you push them. They give the example of Peppa Pig, of something that is so clearly child 
child directed that it's obvious that you should label it as child directed. And then conversely, they would talk about something that is not made for children, like Call of Duty or streaming uh, scenes from Call of Duty. And that's fine, that's just as well, but the world is rife with examples that fall somewhere in the middle, and there's never been a particularly clear-cut line of what to do with those kind of examples. Consider PewDiePie or, or MatPat, who uh, have probably an audience that is the majority of adults, uh, if not at least people over the age of, of 12. Uh, but still, odds are that part of that audience is children. They can't point to any particular audience member being a child, probably. But when you have 100 million subscribers, odds are there's conservatively millions of children who are in your audience. And not to mention sports examples like baseball or WWE, where the main intended audience is probably adults, but it is well known that children love to watch sports as well. And even some of the FTC's clear examples aren't particularly that clear. Think about Pokemon, for example. That is clearly a child-directed video game, or at least it was when it started. But now there is an entire generation of people who grew up playing Pokemon and still play it for nostalgia reasons, and also because they enjoy playing the video game itself writ large. Is Pokemon live streaming for adults or for children? To understand what creators should do, we first have to understand how we got here. And specifically, we have to understand how YouTube has responded to the FTC complaint and the $170 million fine that was levied against them. At base, in 2018, a complaint was filed before the FTC by 23 different advocacy groups for children, privacy, and consumers. The complaint alleged years-long violations of COPPA and millions of dollars in revenue resulting from the collection and use of personal data from children. It also alleged that YouTube is the most popular online platform for children and that 80% of US children use the site daily and that it will soon surpass traditional television as the most watched video format for children. YouTube countered that YouTube Maine has always been for people 13 years and older, and that they created YouTube Kids specifically as a sandbox for children under the age of 13. The FTC has always claimed that that's completely inadequate, however, because children can simply lie and claim that they're older than 13 years old, as we know many children do, and get access to YouTube Maine. And when a child lies, YouTube then uses persistent identifiers for children. It may not be YouTube's fault, but they are using persistent identifiers for children that are lying about their age. And on top of that, YouTube in their marketing materials was actually bragging to all kinds of advertisers that they knew that lots and lots of children were using YouTube main. So the FTC argued that YouTube had actual knowledge that children were using the site. And in fact, they were touting that as an advantage to advertisers. So after litigation and negotiations, YouTube entered into a stipulated settlement with the FTC. Google agreed to pay a historically large $170 million fine, a fine that is 10 times larger than all of the previous COPPA fines combined. The settlement, or consent decree, requires YouTube to develop a system that allows channel owners to identify their child-oriented content. YouTube must also notify channel owners that their content is subject to COPPA compliance, and must also provide annual training to its employees who interact interact with YouTube channel owners. YouTube must also provide data to the FTC about their data collection practices and obtain verifiable parental consent before collecting personal data from children. Channel owners also are required to do a number of things under the consent decree, including they must make a clear and conspicuous disclosure that the channel or content is directed at children. On September 4th, YouTube issued a blog post indicating that it intended to comply with the FTC order by assuming that all viewers of child-oriented videos are children, rather than trying to identify individual viewers and determining their age. Effectively, because the FTC says that if you can't trust the general 13 plus age gate or swing gate to access YouTube main, then YouTube would have to do that. And as we talked about previously, YouTube is going to remove personalized ads and features like comments and notifications from content that is considered directed at children. And on top of that, YouTube is going to try to develop a machine learning system that will be able to determine what content is considered child-directed despite the certifications of the individual creators. 
Now, as I sit, there are two big issues that are going to have drastic repercussions for content creators as a result of both the FTC prosecution and the way that YouTube is deciding to implement solutions to the FTC complaint. Now, the first is that the FTC is not allowing YouTube to have a sort of generalized age gate. YouTube main is for people that are over 13 years old. Effectively, if the FTC is punishing YouTube for children lying about their age and preventing YouTube from using a general age gate in that respect, that has huge repercussions for all creators. Effectively then, the default is to assume that anyone who uses YouTube is a child unless you have verified that they are an adult. That puts huge barriers on all creators and YouTube itself. If the FTC's position is that you can't trust the certification of the user when they say they're over the age of 13. That could mean that the default position is that COPPA applies to anything. Imagine if adults had to certify and show their driver's license to prove that they're over the age of 13 to be able to access YouTube main. The overzealous application of COPPA puts burdens on adults and actually starts running into some constitutional issues that we'll talk about in a second. But admittedly, these are not easy questions. What about accounts that aren't signed in? Who do we assume they are? What about shared devices between adults and children? What about parents who actively give their iPad to a child to watch? And that brings me to the second problem, which I think is a response to the first. And that is that YouTube in response to the FTC demands is saying that any content that is considered child directed in any way, it loses access to the algorithm, to persistent identifiers, to targeted ads, to comments, notifications, stories, all of that is gone. But what about the use case of say an adult that comments on a video that is quote directed at children? Now, certainly we can't have children commenting on videos under COPPA, and we can't have children being tracked using persistent identifiers. But you might imagine that that is trackable on the individual level. If we know that a user is a child, then we can just simply turn off those features for the child. But uh, let me give you an example. Imagine there's a family vlog, and the parents are watching this family vlog. Well, the parents might want to make comments on the family vlog and make comments with other their parents. Or you might be watching baseball, and we know that children like watching baseball as well. And adults might want to make comments about the baseball game. Unfortunately, if YouTube determines that any content is considered child directed, all of those features are turned off regardless of whether that person is an adult or not. So even though COPPA is directed only at children, adults are being affected. If the content is considered child directed, YouTube is taking the blanket position that adults are going to be treated like children as well. That's certainly the safe position for YouTube, maybe the overly cautious position, but from where I stand, that's a huge loss to many communities and many adults. Of course, it's easy for me to say that. I'm not the one that was fined $170 million and I don't run a child directed channel. So with that background, let's talk about the question that's on everyone's mind. What happens to your channel if you think that your audience is in whole or in part children, or you think that your content may qualify as child directed? Well, what happens to your channel depends on what kind of channel you have. There are three different buckets that we need to talk about. One is a creator who directs content to kids under the age of 13. One is a creator who directs content to both. And third is the creator who never directs any content to children and has a very, very small number of children who watch their content. So if you make child-directed content, and for the sake of argument, let's assume that that means more than 51% of your audience is children or whether you are specifically targeting that demographic, though those are not the actual standards that the FTC may or may not adopt. As we've talked about, YouTube effectively has to shut off the algorithm. That means no targeted ads. At best, you're going to be dealing with contextualized ads. It means no comments. It means no info cards or end screens, no recommendations, notifications. You you can't use the community tab, can't use stories. And if the FTC disagrees with your designation, you could theoretically be fined $42,530 for each violation. That being said, the FTC doesn't have all that many funds to go after violations of COPPA. They've only enforced it a handful of times over the years, and we've never seen any YouTube creators so far been prosecuted, though the FTC has specifically said that they could go after YouTube creators. 
YouTube has said it's going to invest heavily in YouTube kids, but it remains to be seen what kind of improvements are going to be made to that and how they're going to make up for the lost ad revenue from uh, the lack of personalized ads. So we can think about whether your video falls into the category of child directed as sort of a flow chart. You might ask yourself three questions to determine if your content is child directed. The first is, did you intend your content for children? The second is, do you have actual knowledge of children watching your content or channel? And the third is, do you think that your content falls into the category of child directed based on a balancing of the 10 factors as laid out in the statute? If you answered yes to any of those questions, then your content is considered child directed. However, even if your content is considered child directed, you can get out of that category if the mixed audience exception applies, which means that number one, the primary audience that you are directing your content is not children, and you meet the requirements for subsections one and two of the mixed audience exception. And as I talked about earlier, it's an open question if any creator can meet those requirements. So that takes us to a creator who has a mixed audience. Now, remember, there are two different things that we need to talk about here. Number one is just because a channel has an audience that has some component of children in it doesn't necessarily mean that the channel itself is uh, child directed. So remember, in the first instance, you have to go through that 10 factor analysis to determine if the FTC would consider your content to be child directed. Or also, COPPA can be triggered if you have actual knowledge that kids are watching your content or using your services. So if you run through that 10 factor analysis and you say, okay, factor number one, this is an adult subject matter. Uh, I don't have any child celebrities. I don't have music that would be attractive to children. And you determine that your content is not child directed as based on those factors, then you might not fit in this bucket at all. But if you feel that under that 10 factor analysis, your content might be considered child directed, or you have uh, actual knowledge that children are watching your videos, uh, then you would need to rely on the mixed audience exception. The mixed audience exception recognizes that some services and videos are appealing to both children and non-children alike. And as a result, it allows content creators to get out of that box of child directed if they meet certain requirements. The so-called mixed audience exception is found in section 312.2 again, and states specifically that a website or online service that is directed to children under this criteria set forth in paragraph one, that's the 10 factors we talked about, but that does not target children as its primary audience shall not be deemed directed to children if, one, it does not collect personal information from any visitor prior to collecting age information, and two, prevents the collection, use, or disclosure of personal information from visitors who identify themselves as under the age of 13 without first complying with the notice and parental consent provisions of this part. Now, some commentators, including my friend and fellow lawyer, Ian Corzine, have argued that YouTube is hiding the ball by not explaining to creators that the mixed audience exception exists and by not making the mixed audience exception an option when you are uploading a video. Unfortunately, I don't think that that's really true, and, and here's why. Remember that the mixed audience exception applies only when, number one, your primary audience is not children, but also it has two additional requirements regarding personal information. It means that operators, and remember, YouTube creators are operators under COPPA now, cannot collect personal information from visitors prior to collecting age information, and that they prevent the use of personal information from visitors who identify themselves as under the age of 13. Now, you might assume that you could just rely on the general YouTube age gate and the fact that YouTube is actively segregating users based on their age. They put children in YouTube kids and they put everybody else in YouTube main. But the, the problem is that the FTC appears to be taking the position that YouTube, let alone creators, cannot rely on the overall age gate, or sometimes called a swing gate, in terms of assuming that people who are using YouTube main are over the age of 13. And on top of that, if you put an age gate on every single video and required people to affirmatively state that they are over the age of 13 before they watched any video that is marked as not directed at children, well, number one, you're putting a burden on adults, which is sort of an iffy area, but if 
YouTube can't rely on their general age gate in the terms of service that says no one under the age of uh, 13 can use YouTube main, then why would the FTC take their word on uh, uh, an age gate on any particular video? Remember that to sign up for YouTube in the first place, you have to certify that you are over the age of 13. And if you put in a birth date that is below that, you will be rejected from creating a YouTube account. And if that's not good enough for the FTC, then the only thing that YouTube can do is what they're doing, that uh, effectively there is no mixed audience exception. If anything is considered child directed, then they have to turn off the algorithm, they have to turn off comments, and we are limited into stating that a video is either directed at children or it is not directed at children. And in a way, children are getting a veto on adult behavior. YouTube may have to take the position that for a child-directed video or a partially child-directed video, they have to remove all persistent identifiers, whether the audience is children or adults. Now, it's unclear if this is required. When Malik Ducard of YouTube spoke to the FTC in October, this is one of the things that he really wanted clarification from the FTC. But for the time being, the mixed audience exception is up in the air. It's not clear that either YouTube or YouTube creators will ever be able to meet the requirements, uh, depending on how strictly the FTC is interpreting their rules. And it's unclear who, if anyone, can take advantage of the mixed audience exception. So what are the consequences of COPPA in this context? Well, we can probably be sure that some people are gonna make less content. Some people are going to be too afraid of the regulations of potential fines. We've already seen people delete their entire channels. We've seen some people take their content behind paywalls and some will lose monetization entirely while others see maybe a 10th of their AdSense uh, as they have to deal with contextualized ads instead of personalized ads. And in some instances, the FTC has said that the alternative to not using uh, persistent identifiers is to remove the videos entirely. That's what TikTok had to do when they got hit with a nearly $6 million fine for almost these exact same COPPA violations. And there are other unintended consequences of COPPA. One of the biggest ironies is that platforms may now be required to collect more data on their users, not less. It forces apps and platforms and websites to get more info about their audience, about their age, and be able to enforce these different age gates. We can probably also be sure that some of the machine flagged videos are gonna be false positives and who knows if individual creators are going to be able to appeal a decision that a video was marked as child directed when they had no intent of directing their videos to children. Of course, as a lawyer, I can't help but wonder if this whole enforcement action is legal in the first place. As I mentioned earlier, I think that there may be some constitutional issues here. I wouldn't necessarily hang my hat on these arguments, but uh, thinking out loud, I can think of some things that may be problematic for the way that the FTC is handling this. First, as I mentioned before, the way that this is being enforced basically restricts content based on viewpoint and the intended audience. And when you are restricting speech based on viewpoint, you run into some First Amendment issues. And I wouldn't say that this necessarily applies, but there is a notion in First Amendment law about a heckler's veto, that you see this a lot in college campuses, that um, just because someone is going to protest and that protest may spawn violent counter protests you don't allow the violent counter protests to stifle the original protest. That's called a heckler's veto. And if we considered child directed to be the lowest common denominator, effectively that has stifled regular speech. That's the heckler's veto. And by analogy, if we said that content that was viewed by let's say 25% of children was enough to trigger COPPA, then that minority of children that watch this content have then placed huge burdens on that content with respect to everybody else who are not children. It's sort of like a child's heckler's veto. And let's not forget that children have free speech rights too. In Brown versus Entertainment Merchants Association decided in 2011, the Supreme Supreme Court struck down a 2005 California law which banned the sale of certain violent video games to children without parental supervision. Just because we're dealing with children doesn't mean that they lack First Amendment protections as well. Fellow YouTube lawyer Jeremy Johnston uh, thinks that this law may be unconstitutionally vague based on the 10-factor analysis. 
that may be the case. I, I have my doubts, but it's an interesting argument. And there's an open question as to whether the FTC has exceeded its regulatory authority. We looked at the original statutory language, and there's a big difference between uh, a child's social security number and the new definition of personal information, which includes persistent identifiers. Now, admittedly, regulatory authorities receive what's called Chevron deference, which means that courts are very unlikely to overrule the rulemaking of uh, various uh, agencies, but at least the Theoretically, they are still bound by the language of the statute itself. Now, I regret to inform you that unfortunately this situation can get worse. The last rule review for the FTC was in 2013. That is what put in place these new definitions that we are just now grappling with. But those definitions could get even worse. There is a big movement to expand the 13-year-old uh, cutoff to even later, maybe 15, 16-year-old, to expand COPPA to apply to teenagers as well as children under the age of 13. There's a big push to expand COPPA past child direct to include child attractive so that regardless of what your intent was, if really any children are attracted to your content, then it's considered child directed as well. The $170 million fine that YouTube had to pay as part of the consent decree was only approved by the FTC as a three to two split amongst the commissioners. The other commissioners wanted to make the fine much, much worse and put in place much more draconian uh, procedures. So things can get worse before they get better. But that raises the question, what can we do? Well, whether you are a YouTube creator, whether you are a fan of other creators, there's a lot that can still be done. First of all, leave comments with with the FTC. Everyone has until December 9th, 2019 to leave comments with the FTC. I'll leave some links in the description for uh, where you can leave those comments and some suggestions as to what kind of wording you should leave with the FTC. Big thanks to Jeremy Johnston who put all of that together, who has spoken to the FTC and has really uh, been the tip of the spear when it comes to uh, creating this movement among creators, recognizing the danger and recognizing that we need to reach out to the FTC. I will say, don't be uh, rude to the FTC, don't call them names, don't use profanity. It's going to be some poor staffer that reads all of these comments, but uh, the more comments that we can leave, the better. Uh, also reach out to the FTC commissioners on Twitter. Uh, I'll leave some links to their uh, Twitter handles. Uh, don't just limit yourself to the FTC comment uh, system itself. Uh, reach out via Twitter as well. Make your voices known. Additionally, reach out to your legislators as well. They can put pressure on the FTC. Uh, their voices would be uh, welcome in this as well. And in terms of feedback, explain how COPPA is going to lead to less content, that it's too much of a risk for individual creators, that it's making it not monetarily feasible for many of the smaller channels out there. Uh, explain that uh, the mixed audience exception needs to be expanded to uh, make sure that uh, creators are safe, regardless of what the FTC may uh, decide on an ad hoc basis. Explain how the YouTube system works and that the age gate should be sufficient, and that it's not fair to treat adults like children, that we should allow adults to be treated like adults. Explain that YouTube Kids is a great place for kids, and for parents that want to take their kids out of YouTube Maine, it presents a great alternative. Uh, and also that we should expand the ability of parents to be able to consent. If a parent hands off their device to a child and allows them to use YouTube Maine, that should be considered a form of parental consent, which is not currently recognized by COPPA. Explain that based on the way that the internet works, using persistent identifiers as a form of PII for children doesn't make any sense. And that the definition of personal information should not include persistent identifiers. Or that persistent identifiers should be treated differently. And for more information, I would recommend checking out Jeremy Johnston and Ian Corzine's channel for the opinion of two other great lawyers. Now, for better or worse, COPPA is just one of the many issues that creators need to deal with online. And while it's not great, the thing that steers creators the most is usually copyright. And that's why I created CopyrightCourse.com to give all creators the tools they need to be able to deal with copyright online and use copyrighted material in a fair use way. You can use the link in the description to get 10% off of Copyright Course and Copyright Course Premium. But but only for the next 30 days. Because the fat cats in Hollywood have hundreds of corporate lawyers that deal with this stuff all day long. What do online creators have? I've represented movie studios, directors, actors, writers, and artists, individuals and multi-billion dollar corporations. And I think it's time to give even the smallest creator the tools that the big guys have had for years. 
And maybe you want to make YouTube videos, but are afraid of doing something wrong. Maybe you already make videos, but have seen a big music label monetize that video. Maybe you want to enforce your rights online. Maybe you've been hit with a takedown notice and can't figure out how to challenge it. Whatever stage you're at, the copyright course will give you the confidence to create what you want and the knowledge to beat bogus attacks on your content. Copyright course distills everything I know about US copyright law, including the major legal concepts and practical advice for how you can use the law to defend your content from trolls. And Copyright Course Premium even gives you written templates based on the actual legal arguments that I have used to defend my channel against dozens of bogus copyright claims. Just click on the link in the description or go to copyrightcourse.com to learn how to make copyright work for you. So, do you agree with my analysis? Are you worried about COPPA? Leave your objections in the comments, and check out my other real law reviews over here in this playlist, where I'll see you in court.